Hi, Greg from Design Spark. Welcome to another edition of Ask the Expert. Today we're going to be talking to Andre Anetti from ST Microelectronics. And today we're going to cover MEMS sensors and predictive maintenance. Hello, Andre. Could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do for ST Micros? For sure. Hello to everybody. My name is uh, Andre Onetti. I'm in ST Microelectronics since uh, 30 years already. My original first assignment was uh, audio. But then I have a very interesting journey that uh, landed, uh, and this is my history of the past 10 years, in the MEMS world. And uh, inside the MEMS world, uh, in the, inside the sensor, wonderful uh, environment. The MEMS sensor is one of the areas that, of course, is uh, exploding in these days. It looks like it's a major enabler for some different new things that are coming. And personal electronics, uh, industrial, automotive are for sure eager to see what the technology can provide next. Fantastic. So that brings me on to the, the first question that we've had submitted from our community. Where do you see the direction for MEMS going um, with the advancement of nanotechnology? What's leading the way and the demand for more MEMS? For sure, let's go a little bit back in time. The MEMS uh, sensor are becoming natural to all of us uh, as soon as we think about uh, personal electronics and smartphones. For sure, at the early beginning, to have the possibility to have a landscape or portrait for your photo was made possible thanks to the fact that there was uh, an accelerometer capable to do the job in a very, very small form factor. At the times we are talking about something in the range of four millimeter times yeah. four. Now the, our smartphones are starting to be populated with more and more sensor, and even the dimensions and the, the form factor of this uh, sensor is getting smaller and smaller. And together with uh, the form factor there was uh, also the enablement uh, of uh, more capacity of the sensor themselves. If we now we look at uh, our smartphone, we don't have just uh, an accelerometer inside. We have even a gyroscope. And uh, the accuracy that you have out of this uh, sensor is getting increased, uh, despite the power consumption has been kept reducing generation after generation. Mm -hmm. I was laughing a few years ago when everybody was mad of Pokemon Go. And uh, the guys were looking, even if they were not uh, understanding what it was uh, really, we are looking for gyroscope inside the phone. Otherwise, it was not possible to have the full capacity of the Absolutely. Pokemon Go. Yeah. So now y we see that the technology allowed to have more and more capabilities inside uh, the personal electronics uh, uh, elements and accuracy is becoming now key because you want to go around uh, the street to be able to be treated as a king with the possibility to have uh, a direction in your walking without any problem despite you are not supported fully by GPS and this is accuracy mm -hmm. and accuracy and sensors is something that goes one-to-one uh, -to -one together the technology now allows to have more and more accurate uh, capabilities in a form factor that, of course, is becoming smaller and smaller. We don't have to be too much technology pusher. We don't need to go too much smaller in size. We need to find always the best trade-off versus what can allow to have the best user experience to the final consumer. Do you see then that you were talking about uh, personal electronics and particularly accelerometers you, you pulled out? I remember from years ago when we first started to have the handheld interactive games came about using accelerometers in the handset. Um, and that was kind of like, the I would probably imagine one of the bigger markets for this type of application. So the, the, the personal use of electronics, is that widespread use actually helping to develop the technology or is the technology itself helping to develop the market for personal electronics? 
At the time, it was the technology available that find the, la the right trade-off, you know, to become, uh, let me say, interesting to have uh, the boom of new application. Here is what is uh, the big challenge of today. The technology is there, but sometimes we don't need to have uh, the possibility to adapt in the right way for what is the need of, of the user. The trade-off in between what the technology is capable and to the possibility to give you a better experience at the right, uh, at the right uh, affordable cost is uh, really the right uh, spot that allow you to, to make the things becoming real uh, and uh, available to the people. Technology for MEMS, and here we'll go to the specific, is a big journey. Here we are using the silicon, not in two dimension for the electrical capabilities, but here we are using the silicon in 3D because we are using the silicon as a mechanical element that needed to be capable to sense or actuate accordingly. We needed to find a way afterwards to make uh, the silicon being more capable than other technology that are not silicon based in order to offer solution to the needs uh, of, uh, of the users. Okay. And with the, the technology and the applications, where, where do you think the biggest growth in the next five years for this type of market is going to be within? Of course, we were talking about a lot of personal electronics because personal electronics allow one, one thing, uh, allow to have uh, scalability because you need really to deliver volumes, volumes in uh, short term, and you need also to be able to address the right cost factor in a very, very short, uh, short notice. So volume, of course, help. But on the other side, now we cannot any longer say that the sensor is just for personal electronics or it was something that was supporting uh, the automotive market. One thing that everybody of us has on top of uh, his head is, for instance, sensor for safety. And an accelerometer is helping an IG accelerometer to have an airbag solution. But same you have in order to have electronic stability or to detect uh, the rollover of the car at the moment that you have, uh, have a crash of an incident. These are things that before were supported by MEMS because uh, of uh, size, because of accuracy, because of convenience uh, versus uh, other uh, available technology. Now we see that the different worlds and among these different worlds also industrial world with the mm, coming industry 4.0 that is uh, asking for, uh, of course, new capacity as well. Uh, you see that all the different requirements are becoming quite, quite sane. Mm -hmm. And there is not any longer a big distinction what personal electronic is, automotive, or even industrial. I always have an example on top of my head. VRAR, we are in the new world of the evolution of personal electronics but you need to have an absolute accuracy of 20 centimeters, otherwise you don't feel well, you are starting to see drift, for at least 20 seconds. But now if you have an autonomous car or safe stop that needs to be done at the moment that you lose all the connectivity, needs to have uh, an immediate 20 second stop with an absolute accuracy of 20 centimeters. Mm -hmm. And don't tell me that it's different in terms of needs. And if in this moment I'm moving to a robot inside uh, an industry line, again, the precision that the robot has is uh, out uh, of uh, range with the current solution. You need to go towards the same limit. Yeah. And today is not done by MEMS, it's done by technology that are not scalable at all. The one that I use in, for instance, for missiles of... Uh, military industry avionics that are bulky, very much expensive, and not scalable at all. What the technology can do, what the silicon technology can do, is to be able to improve performances, to make the things becoming much more affordable, and then to have the capabilities to offer across the different industries with the right cost, uh, cost structure. Okay. One of the 
questions that we've been asked by the community. Uh, we're talking around uh, where do we expect to see advancements and one of the questions was around biotechnology. So in terms of sensors being used within the biotechnology field, are you seeing any demand or are you seeing any applications that, which are coming to light? Again, silicon, at first we needed to, to make ourselves uh, the uh, a question to us. Where silicon can help and uh, where silicon can provide a solution versus what uh, existing technology that today are not capable of. It cannot be anything in silicon. I was uh, uh, always saying that in the past there was uh, uh, a sort of a trend. I will try to put everything in silicon because I assume that silicon can help to reduce cost, to get the scalability and so on. It's true and not true. It's very much dependent uh, case by case. Biotechnology, for sure, will be have uh, will have uh, um, big needs. We need to see if silicon will be able to provide the right, uh, let me say, advantage mm -hmm. in order to make those uh, uh, solution available and Im implemented accordingly. One of the things that, for sure, silicon is capable of is not just sensing is also actuating and actuation today for instance to have a delivery of drugs in a very very accurate uh, way or to have capabilities uh, for instance uh, to put uh, some augmented capacity on, inside your uh, your eyes are possible evolution to mm -hmm. that we need to see if at the end it will be economically and financially sustainable versus the investment that you need to, to have. But technically it's possible, people is working on it, there are already solutions that are uh, available around that. The, the scalability and implementation in the industry is something that uh, has to be validated. Andrea, outside of mobile and automotive, where, where do you see MEMS market growing substantially? Here is a, a real interesting journey that we have seen uh, moving uh, out uh, in, the past, uh, in the past years. Of course, uh, there was uh, the so-called IoT. IoT was a very vogue uh, word a few years ago. Now it is becoming more clear to everybody that will be more and more connected objects that uh, will be part of a bigger network. What is the importance of the sensor out of that? Of course, is, uh, is key because the, the sensor, and in particular, the sensor accuracy, is what will make the difference. I don't want uh, to provide uh, to my cloud any lousy signal that yeah. need to be elaborated. And because uh, you are trying to put more and more to the edge the immediate computing to have a sensor that is not accurate is uh, providing you a bad signals that needs to have at the end uh, some correction and that correction is power consumption yeah. that make your object becoming absolutely useless because not able to stand a very long lifetime mm -hmm. that is the aim of the IoT so here is the, the challenge that uh, uh, you have now from uh, MEMS manufacturer and MEMS sensor manufacturer is to provide uh, the best sensor ever with uh, the lowest possible power consumption capabilities and needs but with the highest possible accuracy mm -hmm. very much tuned to the application and what we, are start we started to do is also to equip our uh, sensors with also some uh, local intelligence and not just local intelligence uh, in the standard way but something that is very much uh, close to AI. So we are starting to put inside finished state machine and even machine learning core that are able to offload the, mm, the main processor that is mm -hmm. on the IoT node in order to make the sensor becoming not just uh, 
good in quality for the accuracy per se, yeah. but also with the capability to offload and to improve the detectability that is required by this uh, IoT node. Mm -hmm. Then people are saying, okay, fine, but you are still talking about IoT. Give me some example. Give me a clear indication how the things are moving. And we see that now more and more we have uh, applications that are becoming tangible. One of the things that is important is, for instance, asset tracking. Each of us like to, to buy mm -hmm. online. Unfortunately, the shops are becoming, let me say, less important because you wanted to have a next day delivery. But next day delivery, it implies to have a full tracking of uh, where your uh, goods are, where uh, also to manage the stock, to manage the logistics, and to manage also the quality of the shipment that you have. And here, what you are basically need, you need to have a connected node that maybe is inside each container, is inside each, uh, each pallet, yeah. is inside in each parcel, with capabilities maybe according to the level of uh, and quality of information you want to, to have to detect uh, the movement of the object, the temperature stress that has been exposed to, or even the shock, yeah. if you are able even capable to detect the uh, of course, uh, the, the happening of, uh, of a fall. And here we are talking about things that technology-wise are very, very interesting. You want to have something that in terms of uh, battery operating is uh, lasting for the lifetime. So we are talking about microamp for accelerometer or temperature accuracy that needs to be in the range of 0 0.5 degree. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you don't, the information is not meaningful. And then if you ask him, for instance, to detect uh, one or, or an if inside something very, very precious, but with a weight that is in the range of a few hundred grams, to detect that, that shock, you need to be able to have uh, a full scale of your accelerometer of 8,000 G, yeah. something that is amazingly stretch high. And these are things that now in the IoT world are becoming more and more available. So it's a nice journey. And then there are plenty of applications that now are becoming more and more uh, available that are going from the wearable, are moving even to now the, the vaping, yeah. where the same technology is, uh, is reused till the industrial world, because even the industrial world is uh, now becoming a little bit more uh, uh, capable to adopt consumer solution, even if in the same framework of a uh, long mm, lifetime longevity commitment. Sure. That kind of brings me on to, and I think we've probably covered most of this question in, in your re recent um, answer there, was with the evolution of IoT and 5G coming together, so for example, you were talking about bringing maybe more of the consumer stuff uh, within to the industrial world, a lot of the benefits of 5G via IoT will fall within the industrial world. So the example you, you gave about sensor and sensor accuracy, when plants become more fully automated with 5G, IoT capability, edge compute and cloud connectivity, the natural kind of um, demand for your product should increase, is that right? Should increase, it should increase, uh, of course, not just uh, the function per se, but also the accuracy that is associated to the function is increasing. 5G is, is another big potential for everybody because it gives you bandwidth and zero latency. And if in this moment we are talking about uh, question that everybody has, 5G is for IoT? Mm. Maybe, but of course IoT, the object doesn't need to call you any single second with a very wide bandwidth, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. 5G most probably will become one of the major enabler of uh, whatever in this moment is uh, the autonomous driving. Yeah. Because at that time you need to have an enormous uh, 
data flow that needs to be transmitted in real time. And in that case, the accuracy that is required by, for instance, by the sensors that will drive the car. I was mentioning in a previous uh, um, discussion the, the fact that uh, you need to have a safe stop. A safe stop is something that is enabled by an inertial system that today is not scalable for the car. Because uh, today whatever is available is available for avionics, is big, mm -hmm. but is not even able to stand uh, the big uh, stretch in temperature, in terms of uh, stress uh, yeah. that uh, the car requires, and it's not scalable. So the MEMS technology will provide that level of accuracy. We are trying to, to go towards that limit because the Cineco in that case can give you the scalability. 5G, autonomous driving, if the silicon technology will support, for sure these things mm -hmm. will become real in, in, a, in a closer time uh, timeline. Then, if we want really to look forward, when people is looking for uh, vertical mobility, vertical mobility for sure today done in an electrical way with drones or whatever, will never, let me use the word fly, <laughs> if uh, you are keep using the same technology bricks for inertial stability. Yeah. It's too bulky. Okay. It's too weighty. And you need to use silicon. But silicon needs to become more accurate. And the journey will start in this uh, technology stretch. So a lot of research and development in that field is continuing. Great. Um, we previously discussed AR, VR. In terms of, of industry, um, AR, VR, what, what type of market does that represent? This is the evolution of, uh, of course, of personal electronics. Everybody is saying yes. And we believe that will be, will be the natural trend. Today we have everything on our uh, smartphone. But if we want a little bit to look uh, forward, most probably your smartphone will become just uh, or display and the button. All the rest will be uh, disaggregated and will go in, on top of your, in your ear, mm -hmm. on, on maybe with glasses. And this information requires any way to be dispatched uh, with the level of accuracy in a very natural way. And I'm back to what in this moment uh, is going to be changed in terms of technology around us. Let's distinguish uh, uh, earable from what will be the, the glasses. Earable today, you have seen that we change already a lot in terms of our habit. We have see we see a lot of people that now goes mm -hmm. with something with uh, the same form factor in the ear, but the technology that is inside is uh, full of sensors. And those sensors are helping also for noise reduction in terms to have a better detectability of your voice. And you are not using, for instance, any longer microphones, even if it's done in MEMS. We are using even accelerometer that are helping you complementing uh, the audio signals to have uh, a bone detection in order to be a sort of microphone without hole yeah. that uh, give you information for low frequency that are very much capable to support uh, the, the best uh, comfortable experience in hearing and, and speaking. Here is something that two, three years ago was not uh, so popular. Now we see that it's becoming mm -hmm. a trend where everybody of the big uh, manufacturing uh, players of uh, personal electronics are moving into. As far as uh, the glasses, and here we have the two portions, either the, the augmented reality and the virtual reality, or whatever will be a mixed among the tools, here's a little bit more difficult. Not because uh, just uh, the sensing technology is, uh, is not ready yet. I was mentioning in autonomous driving before. Here is something similar. We are stretching while we are coming. What in this moment needs to build up uh, is uh, manufacturing availability for another big piece of technology that is uh, the mirror. It's an actuation done uh, again in MEMS mm -hmm. that give you 
the accuracy that is required in order to support the application. And so the glasses without uh, a MEMS mirror in this moment uh, is, not, uh, is not possible. Is uh, the installed capacity for all the different bricks of technology of, uh, required to build up of your system already? We could say that this is a journey, again, that will become visible in numbers uh, in the next five years. I think it's quite fascinating. Um, it brings us on to another question that, that's been asked by the community. Um, do you see electronics manufacturers such as yourself, and you, if you want to expand upon, please uh, do so, working with technology providers and different partners to help bring that reality to life? Absolutely, yes. So first, uh, one thing that is key, you cannot work alone any longer. To work any longer, it cannot be. You need to work with uh, what, who else uh, in the supply chain mm -hmm. is, uh, is there, from the, the equipment manufacturers uh, to the software provider to any kind of material provider that can help in order to really build up an overall ecosystem to make this technology available and scalable. Last but not least, because uh, of technology MEMS, and I'm speaking on behalf of ST Microelectronics, that has a good bunch of, uh, of MEMS technology in our portfolio, from inertial from to acoustic uh, to pressure sensor, uh, humidity, magnetometers, uh, till the actuation. We have a lot of, uh, of good stuff. But uh, of technology MEMS requires usually seven years to, from the time that you started to, to, to work on it mm -hmm. till uh, the time when you are selling the first, the first sample based on that technology with uh, a hit rate and a success rate that is not exceeding the 50%. Okay. So it's a big investment yes. and takes a longer time. Before, we were working very much with the big partner among uh, in the industry could be in personal electronics could be in automotive big guys that we are driving you in the development today we cannot have the luxury to just work with this model mm -hmm. because in this world of seven billion people it's uh, i could say statistically common sense that you find somebody smarter than you in that big community and what we needed to do, and we started to do in the past uh, few years, is to provide the tools to, I could say, the community, to the developers, yeah. to anybody who wants to start to play with the technology as much as possible uh, in a seamless way, mm -hmm. but not just with tools that are based on, pro on running products, yeah. on top-notch technology components that are available to the big guy who is sitting in Korea or in US or whatever, same as uh, the single developers that want to play. Yeah. And to offer solutions that are scalable from just uh, to try and to see what I can do with sensor without even knowing if I need all of them or just one very much specific. But by knowing that that specific is for sure the best in class that you can find it, and then you have the possibility from just to play to go to an industrial design yeah. in a very, very seamless way. Yeah. So this is a, the complete mindset change that we have been done in the, in, in the past few years. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the feedback. And it's very helpful also, this Absolutely. kind of conversation yeah. that we can have from people yeah. is uh, what is triggering the evolution of the technology. Yeah. So you probably see communities like DesignSpark with our engineering base potentially being your, uh, an extended arm maybe of your research and development channels. For, for example, playing with the, the products, seeing what they can devise, any feedback mechanisms. So do, do you see that? You were talking about 7 billion people. Obviously, you know, there's lots of engineers worldwide. You want to try and get as, your products to as many people as possible to get that kind of we feedback. Need that, we need the feedback. Because the feedback in this moment is what makes your life easier in the future. Because we know what to do and sometimes even questions that have been posted today. 
oh, I have this, I could do even that. Because you ask and you highlight a need. Okay. And uh, out of that, the things become, uh, let me say, sequentially natural in the evolution. The risk that we see today is to go sometimes to a very much technology push. But on the other side, you need to get prepared in technology. So to find the right trade-off in between mm -hmm. what you need to invest and what you really needed to support for the needs of the, of the users is really what makes you successful or not. We'll cover some specific questions. Um, so for sensor fusion, for example, how do we compensate for the inaccuracies of individual sensors? Sensor fusion algorithm is one of the major tools that uh, we are providing inside our uh, motion effects library. That is part of our S X Cube uh, MEMS uh, tool. Of course, uh, what uh, uh, we are uh, covering with the sensor fusion is uh, the possibility to compensate the inaccuracy due to offset. Mm -hmm. For instance, we can compensate uh, the, gyro uh, the gyro calibration, or as far as magnetometer, we have the possibility to compensate uh, the hard uh, iron calibration in, in a quite nice way. As far as noise of the individual component, of course, uh, uh, you cannot do that much as far as the, with the sensor fusion itself. It's something that is very much relevant to the single component yeah. per se. And uh, the noise in that case needs to be characterized at the early stage with, and in terms uh, of uh, prediction of what your system is requiring of. If you need really something that in, in terms of noise needs to be very, very good, you always need to consider the possibility to put more than one component in parallel because the noise at the end can be reduced uh, by the roots okay. of those. So With noise, AWGN simulation programs, do they just actually highlight there is a noise potential there or do they actually help to provide a solution for noise? Additive white Gaussian noise uh, uh, is uh, used mainly for space communication. It's a good technique for that in terms of simulation. I don't know how much fits as with the with sensor per se, because here uh, you are adding noise and uh, sometimes it doesn't help. I have an example. For instance, if I have uh, a level inside the, to monitor in infrastructure and to try to understand how much uh, is the environment noise uh, around that, if I should work with a simulation program like that, I'm adding noises and I'm cutting, mm -hmm. most probably also part of the signal that in this moment could be important to be detected by the sensor per se. Here, uh, what is more important for the sensor itself is again, is uh, relevant uh, accuracy and, in the, and that capability or in terms of bandwidth, uh, and noise to, to, to provide the, the right performances. But we are, is not fitting that much with, uh, with our uh, component uh, needs. Okay. I think this one is probably more towards the industrial side of things and predictive maintenance. Um, what would be the recommended solution for the effects of motor vibration uh, with accelerometers, etc., gyroscopes? Uh, again, predictive maintenance is one uh, of, uh, of the big uh, request of conditional monitoring. Here, uh, one of the things that uh, every manufacturer or machine is looking at is, of course, as the capability to detect what uh, is the level of vibration of uh, his uh, equipment and once you have characterized that vibration in terms of noise density, in terms of frequency and so on, you want uh, to be able to detect if there is a deviation. Of course, you are not able today to compensate and reduce the, 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 the vibration per se. This is not the scope of, uh, of, um, of the predictive maintenance. You need uh, to detect when there is a deviation out of the normal functioning of the equipments. What it was before done 
you were using, for instance, piezoelectric uh, vibrometer, mm -hmm. something that uh, was good, 10 kilohertz, pretty expensive, capable to take uh, any kind of uh, uh, vibration in that um, in time frequency range, but it was very much expensive. Now what we have seen that by playing with more sensors, all industrial grade, you can find a smart way to solve the same problem as well. And make an example, I can use for instance uh, uh, an ultrasonic microphone that is able to detect uh, the in the range of uh, uh, tens of kilohertz the first noise of a motor that is starting to have a vibration and uh, that is not uh, the regular one yeah. and meanwhile if you combine this with a temperature sensor with the right level of accuracy you are able to combine with a standard maybe vibrometer of three or five kilohertz mm -hmm. much less expensive than the original piezo 10 kilohertz uh, vibrometer yeah you are able to detect uh, the same uh, set of information. And here we are back to the beauty of the sense of fusion. When you have a sense of fusion that is capable to combine all the different uh, sensors information that are provided with the right level of accuracy, this helps a lot. Yeah, so for each individual application or potential motor, you would recognize the normal operating parameters through your ultrasonic sensor, and anything deviating from that then flags up that there's an issue and may need to be looked at. Yes, and here is very much also specific uh, machine by machine, motor by motor. And again, what ST is providing is uh, tools to the one who wanted to make easy the characterization of the vibration noise of each his own equipment. Mm -hmm. Then how to solve, how to adapt, how to optimize how to enable the solution to your customer, this is something that can be seamless done by the tools that we are providing you. Yeah. So there is a lot of job that now can be required to the equipment manufacturer because each machine is different one to the other. Yeah. So there is a lot of opportunities to go and make uh, assistance to everybody who wants to find uh, the specific so solution to the relevant equipment. And what we want to do is to provide you all the possible tool in terms of uh, sensor, sensor fusion uh, libraries, uh, products, uh, sensors, uh, but without providing you, let me say, or not invading your space yeah. in terms of capabilities to offer a solution to your customer. The next question is very specific, so I'm, I'm actually going to read this because I just want to make sure that I get the message across uh, in the correct manner. So I will be exploring the use of accelerometers and gyroscopes for two-wheeled upright self-balancing mobile robots. Is there any guidance ST can give for angular measurements required and how will compensation or complementary filtering help? This is something that is referring to the theory of uh, the classical inverse uh, pendulum and we recommend to, to refer to the, the wide literature around that. The, for sure, the sensor that ST offers has the right bandwidth and accuracy in order to do the job. Mm -hmm. On the other side, this is part of also what we discussed before. We don't have uh, an immediate library that is addressing completely the fusion for that. And maybe this is uh, a pick that we take from the discussion of today to complement our offering. Oh, okay. In terms of evaluation tools for uh, microphones and audio device sensors, what tools do you actually have that can support that? So ST is uh, using several tools and uh, that are including not just microphones, including all the different sensors. Among those, uh, sensortile.box is one of the most recent uh, launches that we have where we put uh, all the top notches sensor we have in a very seamless way inside uh, a box mm -hmm. in order to make uh, also the possibility for the user first not to be scared by electronic by not even looking at that 
but also with the big advantage of being a box, you can be also IPX5.6 capable. You can put everywhere. We can start to play with it yeah. by working with uh, application on your phone, all connected through BLE. And uh, by having a possibility either to play with uh, application that are ready to go, to start to make data collection if you want. Mm -hmm. And then thanks to the fact that this sensor type dot box have three different modes from uh, the let me say the dummy to the to the pro to the expert, mm -hmm. you can even go and uh, go to an industrial design directly out of that. So either to play and to see what you can get from uh, yeah. from the different sensor, either to go through all an industrial design. So from prototype to end product? Absolutely. But then you can play. I don't know what to do. I don't know maybe if it could be useful for me here making a washing machine. If uh, I need an accelerometer or maybe by having the detection of information of humidity or information related to pressure or the combination of the two. Or maybe if I have the need of a microphone, because the question was around the microphone, I needed to have the possibility to, to look at uh, an acoustic signals mm -hmm. flowing in, into that. So the microphones, so they have uh, the, the sensor type dot box. So then we have something that was even prepared before. It was the so-called blue coin. It was basically uh, a combination of an array of, uh, of, my, of MEMS microphone together again in our uh, BLE, out of that uh, the name blue, with uh, the, the, the size of a small coin that was capable to really to provide a nice service in terms of uh, uh, sound, uh, sound detection, also mm, taking the advantage of having uh, top port uh, uh, microphones uh, with in an array solution. We are moving, of course, uh, our microphone from digital to analog with uh, the commitment of uh, 10 years longevity because we don't want uh, just uh, to offer a solution to the personal electronics mm -hmm. but something that will be complementing the overall offering on sensor in the industrial world and the part of the ultrasonic is also becoming more and more important because you can uh, detect leakage yes. and this is something that is making uh, the, the components suddenly even more uh, appealing than, than others in that space. Yeah, we've certainly seen a lot of content around Sensitile Box on our, our own community of DesignSpark, so um, I would advise people to go and have a look and see what content has already been created. Just one of the last questions we have, which is very specific, we were talking about ultrasonic and leakage detection. The question that we're being asked is, for gas leakage detection, are there any particular products that you would recommend? We have an analog uh, single-ended microphone, the MP23ABS1, that is uh, one, uh, one element that is specifically designed, of course it's analog because you do not want to have any kind of limitation down to the fact that you have uh, an A to D stage inside that could limit the bandwidth. We have seen capability to go up to 80 kilos to detect uh, signals mm -hmm. and this is becoming a very very powerful tool because you are uh, able again with the fusion of other signals to start to, to smell yeah. the sound of the of the gas uh, pipeline leakage mm -hmm. so uh, andrea with the more industrial kind of take on predictive maintenance, for example, edge computing and cloud. Are there any programs and software which users can come to ST to use to benefit for their applications? For sure. At first ST, what we tried to do uh, in our offering in terms of tool was to have uh, the seamless uh, uh, connectivity to, to cloud because one of the things that is important for everybody is to be able immediately to go and take advantage of data collection and then to have uh, all the computing done somewhere in a very seamless way. What is the challenge now? The challenge is that you want to have, uh, of course, the capability to offer solution to your users with components that are aligned to the, 
industrial standard, where again longevity commitment is one of the of the key factor of differentiation. And on the other side, what you want to offer is uh, or solutions to today that are providing you the top-notch technology sensor availability because this is part of also our strategy in mm -hmm. order to enable everybody with the best in class since time zero. Today we have uh, solutions that are uh, based for industrial uh, world uh, still on uh, Estival BFA001 that is the father of our next to come uh, RISPIN that will be available in a uh, few months mm -hmm. from now that is uh, the so-called ST-WIN. Here again we have uh, the top-notch uh, sensor for industrial world that will be perfect in order to, to match the needs uh, of a conditional monitoring uh, application with a seamless connect connection to cloud. And here we can go even with GUI such as our predictive maintenance dashboard okay. that can go uh, and can easily manage all uh, the, the flow to, to cloud and all uh, the information uh, to cloud to AWS where, where there is everything built in even if our solutions today are uh, expandable to also the other cloud provider uh, some others uh, on top are uh, Microsoft Azure and we have seen that uh, even Microsoft recently has made announcement that our tools on top of what I mentioned before on the DST win but even our sensor type dot box are the perfect match in order to expand the capabilities of offering and to play around sensor and to let the user capable uh, of uh, or play around that mm -hmm. and to give uh, his added value yeah. taking advantage of what is uh, the cloud offering and uh, the quality of the data that you can uh, detect uh, from, uh, from the tools. So the, the idea of uh, ST in this moment is to make as much as slim as possible the offering of uh, software and, and cloud uh, needs towards the tools that we are providing uh, in this moment. And uh, we are very much compatible to all the different worlds. So we are not very much uh, specific. We are trying really to, to cover and to go across all the, all the different needs. Yeah. So it's quite apparent that it's really important for you guys as well as providing product. You're providing an ecosystem with solutions and places to develop, but giving the customer everything he needs to get the job done. And we have a big ecosystem that is based on our uh, STM32 um, ARM-based uh, microcontrollers. So this is uh, the, our 32-bit microcontroller is uh, a strong, strong asset of ST. The evolution also of these families towards the cloud, uh, towards the expansion to AI is also one of the things that will become more and more important. And we are seamless connected to that ecosystem in order to provide just the sensor with uh, the accuracy that you need, at the lowest effort of calibration for you by also uh, reducing it mass, as much as possible the power consumption needs according to the budget that you have in, in, your, in your pocket for your application. Right. Well, that's the end of the discussion. Um, I'd really like to thank you for coming in today and appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to answer questions that have been posted by the Design Spark community. So thanks to our community for posting those questions. And I've really enjoyed our conversation, Andrea. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.